All right, good afternoon. When I was 10 years old, have your attention now. Um, when I was 10 years old, I got a uh, book, a little book as a present. The book was called Kum B'Chachma. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's an oitzer of Milsa Dibdichasa, Divrei Chidudim Aparparais from the Nasir Chabad and Chsidim. And uh, at that age, I appreciated this type of book. And among the uh, Vertlach in this book, that's uh, still uh, stuck in my head until now, is something the shame, the well known Chasse, the Rav, Manes Friedman. Um, made it, he managed to make it into the pantheon of Chasidish uh, Chabad Vertlach. Uh, he's been around, of course, for uh, 50 years. I checked. He went to Minnesota in 1971. So he's gone through many phases and iterations. This dates back to a much uh, earlier phase. Akopanim, he said the following story. You have to imagine it in his voice. I'm not going to. Uh... So what Imanus Friedman says that he was once invited to speak to some young people about uh, Yiddishkeit. Now, he knew that whenever he has a lecture, whenever he appears before these people, the question always is, why do Jews, why do Hasidim wear black? And he got tired of being asked this question and having to answer the question each time. So he decided one time he's going to show up in a leather motorcycle jacket. Sidestep the whole issue. So he comes to the hall, he gives his lecture, and then when he finishes the lecture, it's question and answer time, and uh, the first person raises their hand and says, yes, what's your question? And he says, why do the Hasidim always wear black? So didn't help. So this is a question, obviously, that many people like to ask. So we're going to discuss this question in a sense. Now, this question is both a historic question. Why do we, namely so-called Haredim, whatever you want to call them, why do we look different? Why do we dress differently? Um, then specifically, you can start asking, why do we look different than Pahil Sheikh If we're both trying to look different, why do they look much more different and we look slightly less different? We, are, we look very normal with our hats and jackets out in the summer. Uh, by the way, my personal impression is, is that if you ask someone who doesn't know the differences and distinctions, the Litvish Bacher with the uh, aftershave and a short jacket and the, the, the Chassid Shayil with the long, the long beard and the payas and the Zak, they, 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 they all look the same to them, just uh, as a, my, my impression. They're all Hasidic Jews. But there is a difference. We, we at least see or perceive ourselves to look a little different than them. So the question is why? How did that happen? And there's also a halacha question here, which is, are we allowed to dress just like the gun? Are we allowed to look identical to them or not? And if not, what's the definition? What's the distinction? How do we uh, determine uh, what's appropriate? And the answer to uh, all those questions is in, uh, in one word, or more exact, in two words, Xedas uh, Hamalbushim. Xedas Hamalbushim, in a nutshell, is that Tsar Nikolai in the Russian Empire in the 1840s decided that the Jews need to update and upgrade their appearance, how they look, and we can thank him, quote-unquote, for the repercussions of that decree till this very day. Now, the decree was actually not only for men, it was also for women, and in fact, the reason that I ended up uh, choosing and landing on this topic uh, today is as a result of this new sefer that just arrived this week, Charles Chuvas Mahari, Rabbi Yosef Tumarkin of Kremenchuk. It was put out by uh, two young white men, Chachamim, a Kiddushir that I know uh, a bit. So in Simandala, there's a discussion between the Rabbanim at that time about a, a special hairnet or something of that sort for women to wear in the mikveh, and whether it's okay or not. And what's the pshat? So in the footnote, they explain that until then, Yiddish women in all these countries used to shave their head completely after the chasana. Um, so in fact, for those familiar that with the fact that other communities still do that, instead of asking why they do that, the real question is also, again, why are we different? Because apparently the middag was once universally in these countries that women... I'm not saying that. Up to the... Hmm? Okay, no, we're talking about uh, the recent Eastern European culture that we come from, and uh, the women up till that point all shaved their heads after the chasana. Um, and one of the reasons being, uh, presumably, for the mikveh, just makes it easier. Um, and then this gzeda came along, and they had hair. 
So now there's new shilas. They're, they're tied by the mikveh. The hair might float up. It's more difficult. They weren't used to having to take that into account. So that's how they, with this new problem, so they're looking for new solutions, and that's how they ended up with this discussion. If you can use a hairnet made of hair, and it's not a problem, not a chatzitza, and it's not a this, not a that. These chuvas were actually first printed in a sefer called Chuvas Maharish, and then it was reprinted in Yagel Teira Tzemach Tzedek of Eretz Yisrael, and then again here in this new sefer. So if you look at the end of Rabbi Yosef Tamarkin, who was arguing that it's a good idea, so he writes, Al Kupanim, you please let me know why you think otherwise. Where does it say, Titpa Lechatchila, Afilu Bechutei Seyer, Afilu Mishim Chomer Ba'alma? And he says, and anyway, I want you, he says, The opposite, because you're, you're so concerned about this, uh, you know, wearing this. What about the opposite, chashash? I says, I, I, he says, I asked, I asked the mikvah ladies, they say, they can't really see this in the dark, it's hard for them to tell what's going on with the hair. In the dark, it's hard for them to tell what's going on with the hair. What they do see is, that's because the women are aware that now they have a problem with their hair, so they're bending down extra. You're not supposed to really do that. Uh, so he's asking him, uh, don't just reject it, uh, take this into consideration. The response of Rameshul Maran Yaivitz of Kremen which is also printed in here, so he responds on the halachic issues, and then he writes at the end that he... He took the concern seriously. He also looked into it. He says, I sent, special, I sent my wife, the Rebetzin, his Rebetzin, and I sent Aisha Samufla, Reb Isaac Gurari. It's interesting to try to figure out uh, how he's related, if and how he's related to the famous uh, Gurari from Kremen Shuk. Um, I sent, they sent these two to check it out, and they came back and reported that, no, you could see with, with candles, you can see very well what's going on. You can be on top of it. It's not a problem. And uh, Shulam Aaron mentioned, he's also from Kerem and he also, he mentions about Veni Sinner and Avim. At this point, we have a lot of men who are also growing longer hair. And uh, everyone gets a chanet, so you figure out how to go to the mikveh without creating new problems from your new solution. And that's how, uh, that was the spark to discuss this Indian. That's on the, the woman, on the, the woman front. But back to uh, the Etzim topic, um, to understand this a bit better, we can perhaps uh, be magdir, we can define that when it comes to, we talk about Ashkenaz, Yidden and Ashkenaz, you could divide it into two groups. There's Germany and there's Poland. Of course, there are other countries in Europe, Italy, Holland, but they don't represent Ashkenaz. So in Germany, it's, it seems that they were always a little bit more up to date. We already mentioned, we're speaking about like Weimar and Svira and the Mercedes about even Le- Shainim seemingly uh, touching their beards. And they also seem to generally have dressed more closely to the way the Gaim dressed. And even the from the Charedim, the from Ayyidim, kept on updating over time. As time went on, they also updated along with the times to whatever extent. Mashiach in Poland, Poland was the most regressive. So they were mamish dressing as, you know, as old-fashioned and as out of uh, character with uh, the population as possible. Now, when we speak about Poland... Poland includes Lithuania, Russia, it's all one big Ispashtusa, the Yidin in Lithuania and Russia are all coming from those Yidin in Poland. Um, and if you look, you can start going further back. Before the Alter Rebbe, it's not even clear that anyone even recognized that there was any distinction between these groups of Yidin, that they're even seen as different. By the time of the Alter Rebbe, of course, you already have a certain distinction between a Litvak and a this and a that, but that's more about uh, learning and personality and outlook. But it seems that at that time, everyone still looked pretty much the same. Of course, nothing to do with Chassidim and Misnagdim either. And so it was a very, very, very ancient looking getup, the way the coat looked and the pants, chas v'shalom, not full long pants. The shoes were different. Of course, the payas were, were long, were big. The beers were full and long. Uh, the streimlach, the head coverings. Could be there were still some distinctions regionally, but geographically, but overall, whatever hats people were wearing were looked very old. They had big yarmulkes back then, not like the yarmulkes we have today. Even the most for from the Haredi today is yarmulke is still considered like a small yarmulke compared to the big square yarmulkes that surround their entire head. You could still see in pictures from a hundred years ago. And and only so. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, those days before 1840, so. 
all he needed was fitness and everyone else. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and all he needed was fitness itself was the same. In Poland, Lithuania, Russia, yes. Germany was different. We're making a distinction between Germany and countries, not area, Bohemia, Moravia, that's one category, and then you have Poland, Lithuania, Russia, that's what we're talking about. The, the Germans look, the German Jews look more like the guy in throughout the generations. Okay. Um, only someone who was getting a little kalia, someone who was becoming a life declared, so then he might have voluntarily started changing his clothing to look more like the Deutschen, to look more like a German, a German Jew. That's the status quo till we arrive at the time of the time of Tzedek and the Gzair. Now, the Gzair itself, I don't know how familiar, if at all you are, but even if you're not really familiar, I'm sure you're, you've heard bits, tidbits. So, for example, it's the famous Mice of the Bill Pyachir and the Payas and the Taylor, right? It's in Shmos Vesipurim, Falakan, and Anacho, Bill was in Babraisk, and there was the Gzair to cut the Payas, and you went out in the street, the police would grab you and cut the Payas. One time, Bill went in the street, and uh, an officer stopped him and wanted to cut his payas, if he was covering his payas, it was a fight, it was a struggle, and then this tailor passes by, and he sees what's going on, and uh, he actually had a relationship with the officers, uh, he sold them clothing, and when he saw Reb Hill, his mamish, uh, you know, inside the, you know, police, his mamish, uh, thrashing him, so he started screaming, let him, let him go, leave him alone, he's a holy Jew, and the officer let go, and Reb Hill was very happy that his payas were saved, and he told the tailor, I promise you that uh, you'll be Ibn Chitsasi. And then the story continues of how uh, the tailor ended up being very next to the bill, even though no one else knew uh, to be Mekayim this set up. Um, of course, there's a separate discussion about the length of payas, and uh, even if the payas aren't long, the payas could also be big and bushy, which you see as well. So even if you're avoiding mixing with the beard, depending on how you understand the Arizal, but you still have big payas in other words. So another uh, another thing you see in the Chassidish Mekayir is about uh, the hats, Umar the idea that you're supposed to see the sky, because until then people didn't wear hats at all. They wore these big yarmulkes, and that was the uh, the, the yarmulke itself was almost the size of a hat, or sometimes it's called a mitznefes. And some uh, right, you see some old yarmulkes of tzaddikim, they look uh, pretty uh, pretty huge. Um, but there's no there was no brim sticking out, and then. Uh, the gzera was that there should be a kazerak, there should be uh, a brim, something sticking out, and the whole opposition among the chassidim was that, oh, they don't want us to look at the, the shemaim, it's ma'er to yer shemaim, and now they want to block it, so you're supposed to look up, so they did, maybe you turn your, you know, you can wear it, but you can turn it to the side so it doesn't actually block your, your vision. So that you may be familiar with as well, but to understand this, a little more Masudar before we get to the halacha. So I, I figured maybe we can look uh, for outside sources that describe this uh, bit of history. So there's someone by the name of uh, Professor Anthony Polonsky of Brandeis. He has books called The Jews in Poland and Russia. Uh, volume one covers 1350 till 1881. So from the beginning of Jewish settlement in Russia till the end of Malash And volume two is 1881 to 1914, a whole book just about the Tzkuf of Ebed Hashab. And then there's a third one for the Tukuf after that, which is already uh, recent history. So in, cha- in volume one, chapter 11, he has a chapter on Tsar Nikolai and the Jews. Of course, we can't get into all the background, but the, overall, the, what you have to know is that uh, at that time, Russia had conquered Poland. Poland was no longer an independent kingdom. Poland, Lithuania, it all became part of the Russian Empire, and all of a sudden, the number of Jews in Russia shot up tremendously. And the Tsar and these people were always super paranoid, generally about uh, p- p- something from a, from a political standpoint. But any group that seemed slightly different was always perceived as a threat. Uh, if you're not going exactly, not only Jews but also other minorities, um, if you're not going like a you know total mainstream Russian, so that's where all these Xeras start appearing, which were not the deal. They weren't mamish out. Uh, you know, shmad all the yidden. That wasn't uh, the stated goal, but the old exodus. What they had in common was they're trying to really push and pressure the Jews to integrate more in society. And that, in fact, that that uh, motivation and what exactly the motivation is actually is relevant to the halachic shaila because if one of to say is it a shasa shmad or not, you have to define what is the malchus actually trying to do. So I'm going to quote a little bit from this book. Um, so it's all about someone by the name of Pavel Kisilev. Uh, his name is mentioned once by the Fidik Rebbe in the uh, Almer Samachsedev Tzunos HaSkala, but uh, he's not the main character there, but he's the main character with these Gzedes. 
look him up. He has his own Wikipedia entry. Uh, the way he's described often is as he was progressive. Now, and they don't even mention now, you know, how Jews factor. And then you look it up, you just look up the, you know, the encyclopedia entries. They don't even mention, that, you know, what uh, significance and impact they had on Jews. But uh, interestingly, he's described that way, and you may or may not want to draw parallels to what you know the word progressive means today. But uh, for for 18 years, he was the uh, imperial minister of state properties, and he was tasked with uh, the, the the problem of the Jews. So uh, in 1840, in Tafresh, he uh, there's a there's a memorandum, a memo he gave to the emperor on the ordering of the Jewish nation in Russia. Um, and he starts off by saying we have all these problems with the Jews and the Talmud and the, the Kohol is its own little uh, dictatorship inside uh, Russia. And there's the kosher meat tax, which funds the Kohol. The special dress uh, makes, means that they feel separate. So he said, we're not going to just make Zetas to make the Jews feel miserable, Stamkacha, which was the traditional the European approach. It was just to uh, make Jews' lives miserable uh, for, the, for the sake of it. He said, our goal should be to transform them by removing the harmful factors that obstruct the, their path to the general civil order. So we have to re-educate the Jews, and so we're going to make schools, and uh, the rabbis have to be certified in the schools, and we have to uh, change the, the Jewish dress. Then further on, further on, on page 382 and on, so they legislated in accordance with Kislev's recommendation to ban specific forms of Jewish dress to... Uh, reduce the separateness of the Jews. Um, and they felt also economically it's going to, they'll be more integrated that way. Um, so it was first raised in 1804, Tafrish Dalet. Um, started off as when the Jews leave the Pale of Settlement, it was a very narrow strip of, land, of, of Russian land they were allowed to live in. If they leave, they have to dress like Germans. If they move, if they go to Petersburg, to Moscow, they have to dress in German dress which uh, at some point, you know, German, I guess, became, they changed it to Russian dress. Um, but we, with the Russian laws, you have to remember, sometimes the law's on the books and it's not uh, obeyed, and sometimes you have the opposite. The, the law doesn't really say much, but the, the people on the ground are enforcing it, uh, you know, with extra gusto. So it seems like this didn't uh, kick in as much. And then, as time went on, Sorry, 1804 is Tafkov Samach, uh, Tafkov Samach Dalet. So that's when it started. In the time of Al Rebbe already, Rebbe Hamajabas writes to Al Rebbe, but oh, I know you travel to these big cities. Does that mean that you dressed uh, in a Goyesh way when you went to those cities? That was that much earlier. Um, but then in the 1840s, I don't know if that's Negev to uh, dressing like Goyim, but that's Negev to dressing fancy, yeah. But in the 1840s, which is the, the Tafrashas, the first the decade of the Tafrashas, so that's when it gets serious. And of course, that's when you also have the Maskilim who are on their, on their own are trying to pressure the government to, to modernize the Jewish community for their own agenda. The Maskilim and the Russians didn't actually have precisely the same agenda. Maskilim were more intellectual, more enlightened, more open-minded than the Russians themselves were. So uh, they didn't always actually see eye to eye, but they write, the quote here, you know, Mamish Bashmutzing the Yidden of how uh, the Jews look. They say, anyway, when the Jews go to Petersburg, they change their clothing. So you see, it's not so uh, um, So as a consequence, they had this comprehensive set of decrees enacted banning Jewish costume. So they defined it as silk hoods, belts, fur hats, so-called coverings without peaks, yarmulkes, short trousers, and boots for Jewish women, wigs of any sort that match their hair color, and this was introduced in stages. Um, uh, started off uh, by 1851, it would be everywhere except for those who are already over 60, we'll leave them alone. Um, at, in the beginning, they actually, there was a fine. You could continue wearing Jewish clothing, but you had to pay a fine. And that comes up a lot in these discussions. You have to pay three to five rubles to wear a yarmulke in public. And then they ban you pay us entirely. Then they banned women were forbidden to shave their heads upon marriage. So. All of this information is attested to. Also, there's still a lot of Russian documentation out there. Um, quotes here from uh, Pauline Wengerov, who's a famous uh, memoir about what, you, what life was like for Jews in Russia. She writes that uh, this Yukasa was called the Gezeira, not one of the many Gezeiras that overcame the Jewish people, but simply the Gezeira. Like this was the top, the worst Gezeira. A lot of documentation of Jews complaining, sending complaints to the government, how they're being mistreated, 
it says at one point, Rabbi Yaakov Yosef Halpern of Redditchev was mentioned in the Asifa with the Tzemach Tzedek. It says he donated at least a thousand rubles to cover all the yarmulkes for uh, a whole group of Yidden. So it was, uh, it was Freilach. That's the, uh, the background. Now, while we're on this topic, I have to point out there is a big uh, article uh, as well in Hechel Bar Shem Tov Yud Beis from Tavshin Samach Vah by Rav Amram Bloy, one of the three Chabad uh, Bloy brothers. The fourth one actually is the one who wrote this farm on Ribis and McVeis. Um, Rav Amram uh, was killed tragically in Tavshin Ayin Tess in, in an accident. Anyway, so he wrote a lot of articles in the last uh, decade uh, in Hechel Bar Shem Tov, and he wrote one called Gedolei Achasidus Uxedus Amal Bushim, and he's been signed a lot of shot. But the article itself is not really a halachic article. He just quotes a few lines here and there, more about the history and what's going on. So we're going to try here to get a bit more into the actual halacha, especially for the Tzemach Tzedek. And we already mentioned Rabbi Yosef Tamarkin earlier, which is also a tshuva related to these, these topics. So the big makar and halacha on this whole topic is the tshuva of the Mahadik from the 1400s in Italy. And before the Mahadik, we have the Rambam. The Rambam writes in Hilchus of the Desire Parak Yudalaf, so that's a general negative statement. And here's a, this is like a general positive statement. You should be moved on. Um, and then he says, they said speaking of Farit, and he says, So that's where they're getting specific. Also, not fully clear, though, what that actually means practically. What does it mean, uh, what does it mean, what does it mean, what are we talking about exactly? So, the big major text on this is the Maharik, and I once gave a share that focused on the Maharik mainly, and here we're just going to quote the highlights. Um, so, the Maharik was in Italy during the time it's called the Renaissance, that means that there's a certain openness uh, between the Jews and the non-Jews, etc., which may have influenced this question. This tshuva was written to Behuda Mister Leon, who was a doctor and a rov and a very interesting Jewish character in Italy at the time. So he writes there about the kapa, Asher Kasafta, Behi Arucha Adlaore, Toileches Ponem Baacher, Psucha Minatstod, and he's describing this big uh, garment. And that people started saying that it's Chukas Adayim. So I've seen people that refer to this tshuva and they just assume that Marek is talking about wearing a white uh, doctor's coat. But uh, historically, a white coat is a very, very recent thing. So what is a kappa? So if you look up uh, cape in English, where the word cape comes from, the word cape actually comes from this word kappa, which means in Latin, in Latin, a hooded cloak. So if you ever see pictures of the Middle Ages and you see people wearing these heavy cloaks with the hoods, that's a kappa. Um, he's, that's what he's describing. And uh, we know today... Um, when people graduate uh, university, maybe it's even into the, came to some Jewish schools, you wear uh, a gown. So that's what also the same thing, that's the hishtalshalos of the cape that we're discussing. Um, there's a long history, but Chalau University started off as uh, education for the monks in the monasteries, and the cape may have been more like a monk's clothing, but then the university evolved and there were secular degrees you could get, it didn't have to be religious, and they also used to wear these capes as uh, once you graduated, that's what you got to wear. My dick doesn't address that whole uh, background. Um, so in this case, there's a Yid who studied the medicine, and he wants to wear the kappa now, because uh, that shows that he graduated. And then there's the macha, people are saying, you're wearing a cape, you're wearing, that's a good issue thing. So some have suggested that the person asking the question was, it would be Huda on himself. Because not only did he have a doctorate in medicine, and Italy is famous for the fact that while all the countries in Europe banned Jews from higher education, Italy did allow, at least in, in, in Padua, I don't, know, I don't know about anywhere else, but you're allowed to actually, Jews were allowed to attend and, and get a degree. Uh, and in fact, Jews from Eastern Europe who wanted a degree in medicine would actually travel to Italy from, the, this is, we're starting with Thomas Marik now, till the time of Ebed Shab. There were still young men who went to Padua to get a degree because you still couldn't get one in uh, in Russia or the nearby countries. When? 1400s. This is like the 1460s around. So this should have been Yehuda. Not only did he have a doctorate, he even got permission to issue doctorates to other people, to other Jews. So he was a very important guy. So it makes sense that he was probably the one asking the question. And Marik is asking, okay, so is this a problem or not? It comes from a Gaish background. So he says, Ani as daiti that chukas hagoyim. Chukas is the word chayk. And chayk, he says, you can compare it to the chukim in the Torah. Chayk is something that either we don't know the time or doesn't have a time. 
So the same as Uma said for the Goyim, it has to be something where there's no reason, no normal reason to do it. And if you're doing it, that shows that your mom is going along with what the Goyim want to do. Another reason is if there's a princess element, something that uh, about the way you're dressing or the way you're behaving just seems the opposite of Tznias and Anav. Um, it says, and even then it has to be that you're doing it to imitate them and not for some Te'elis you do it. If there's a clear reason, a logical reason why you're doing it that's beneficial to you, then it should be fine, according to the Ma'arik. It's Kol Shekein, the Kappa, there's no Iser. Says, we know why they wear it. It's Simon, Hayesam, Mesigim, Bechachma, Hahi. Um, so it's all for the Te'elis, it's all for the benefit, for your status. Uh, the COVID, the, the profits you can make once people will identify you as a doctor. So uh, there's no intention here to be Madame. And even they themselves are not doing it for Goyeshkai, they're doing it for COVID and the Te'elis. So according to Maria, it doesn't matter, even if you look mamish like a Goy, there has to be something additional, some negative here that uh, makes it usher. Now, besides the din of Chukas HaGoyim, which we've been discussing, there's also the din of Arkas of the Masani in the Gemara, the shoelace, right? Mishas Hashemad, even the shoelace are not allowed to change because it's seen as part of Yiddishkeit, and the Goyim are trying to uproot Yiddishkeit. So even if they target the shoelace as part of Yiddishkeit, that's also part of Yiddishkeit now, and you have to be Meisir Nefesh. So here and throughout the conversation discussion later on, there's really two questions. Are we allowed to change on our own? That would be the Chukas HaGoyim question. And then... Even if, let's say, maybe it's not so bad, but what if the Goyim, what if there is something associated with Jewish behavior and the Goyim want to change it, do we have to be Meister Nafish now? But, uh, but there's still a lot in common, and usually if you're being Meister Nafish, it means there's some association with Yiddishkeit, so maybe we can learn something from Arkes of the Masani about Chukas Agai. So he says, among, I'm just quoting highlights, he says, that uh, in the Rishonim and Ashkenaz, they wrote that, then it's us, Aksa. But if you on your own want to go undercover, you don't want to be recognized as a Jew, the Goyen, this is quoting from Germany, from the, the, the Rabbeinu Peretz, the Goyen, the Smak, and Maram, Goyen Lubesh, Big Day Nachri, Shekoyen Rei, Oyle Snag, Bedover, Shloy, Nicker, Mutter. What's a Rei? So uh, it's referring to some kind of striped clothing. And it's quite interesting to look into that whole piece of history. It seems like the, the, in Germany at that time, they looked a little different, but they also, if they're on the road, if they, if they felt like they're in, in an unsafe situation, they like to switch their clothing to even more guys looking clothing so as to not arouse, uh, to draw attention. Uh, so in other sources that say that when they were on the uh, road, they would wear high boots, and when they, were, when they felt safe, they used to wear regular shoes, and a lot of other interesting sources like that from then. So they discussed... If it was mutter, and that was what they were saying. Like, arcs of the Masan is only a problem if they're making you, but if you on your own want to go into cover, it's fine. So that's something Marek quotes as part of a point he's making. Then the Radek turns the actual directly to the topic of arcs of the Masani, um, which sounds like that we're just wearing different shoelaces just for the sake of it. And he says, no, for Kurt, as Rashi says, in Sanhedrin, Derech HaGoyim Likshar Derech Kach, but Derech Yisra Likshar Derech Acher, Kigoyim Rashi adds, She Yesh Tzad Yadas Bedavar, so he says, you see here it says, So that means the opposite. The Goyesh shoelaces, there's some princess in their shoelaces. Not stomach, it's arbitrary that we just happen to have different shoelaces. If otherwise, it should have said so. Uh, so if the, if the guy just say, you know, uh, change your buttons or something, there shouldn't be a problem if there's no uh, significance to that. Because even the ref who writes clearly that the Yid and Dafka wore black shoelaces and the guy and Dafka wore red, Yishlai married that the problem was Dafka with the red. Red is a problem, it's a problematic color. We know from other places to avoid the color red. But if the Goyim were wearing black shoelaces, we could also wear black shoelaces. It's not that we're always doing a different color, Badafka. He mentions that till today, the Jews in Italy, that's one thing their Nizr says that we only read. Even though someone pointed out that the Kappa itself and all the color drawings we have is actually uh, bright red. So it's a little hard to understand how that fits. But he says we avoid red. We have the Moran Brachas, the woman was wearing red, he ripped it off. But stam colors shouldn't be a problem. So he, if I care from here, from here also, he wants to prove that it has to be pritzus, not just looking different for the sake of being different. 
Ah, what about the Rambam? The Rambam said, Shiyiyya, Yisro, Muvdu, Mehem, Bumabushu, Bishar, So that sounds like we should actively strive to look different. So he says, No, look at the Hemshech. Vula Yilbush, Bumabush, Amayuchud Lahem. It says, The Pshita, the Rambam, Shalachi, of Lishtanis, Minhagoi, I'll call upon him that uh, we have to be different no matter what. That's not what the Rambam, no, it can't be. Vadai, that only Malbush, Amayuchud Lahem, meaning there's something that's very unique about it, and the Jews already have said, Okay, Mishum Tsnias, we're not wearing that. And that is something has to be some kind of national garb, some kind of national costume. It's machmas geyusan, connected with their identity as a nation. Avla kapa zois, which isn't identified with a nation with goyim. It's the chachamim, a pnei chachmasan. It's not a goyish clothing. It's a smart man's clothing. It happens to be that uh, all the smart people until now are goyim, but it's for smart people. So, and even a goy, a stama goy can't wear it if you're not a chacham. You can't just uh, impersonate one. Um, so in France, uh, even the Chacham don't wear it there. Pshita, Pshita, that's not the Malbush Hamayucha that Rambam was talking about. So Mela, that's how he understands the Rambam. So he's limiting the Rambam very, very much over here. And then, after this whole thing, he reveals that, by the way, this is actually Negea to all the Jews in Italy. He says, V'yafek Saftem, that if we actually go with this Shita, that there's a problem with the Kappa, then Yitzhara HaYisro Lashanas Malbush, so Adam Tzadik Ba'aretz. We're all uh, in trouble here in Italy, because in Italy they're also a lot more uh, advanced in how they dressed. The Dor Shekulei Chayev Huzeh, we're all in trouble, we're all bad news. She'en Adam B'dor Hazeh, Shal Yilbush Levush Adem Levush Zkeinayim, or Levush Yaldeya, and either we look like the old Italians or like the young Italians, but uh, we all look like them, so uh, you're going to be Aser, Mashin Lago, Kol Yisro, but Pumbi, you know, that you realize what you're saying, you realize you're starting up with everyone here, you don't want to say that, right? So I say, there's no uh, to look different at all. Just don't wear malbush miyuchet. So for sure, the kappa is fine. Then the Marit keeps on going through other stories in Chazal where Jews look like goyim, goyim look like, and there's a lot of stories in Chazal that touch on this and what you can try to extrapolate from there. Um, among, while he's making a point about one of those mekaitas, he does say, Maybe Taka, the only thing that was different was the shoes. Which is a test there that the Dafka, you should wear different shoelaces. Maybe they, if they did feel they have to be different. Maybe all you need is one little change in your shoe. Um, it says the whole appearance Damn it, unthinkable that the Nama would have meant that you should take a change all your malbushim. The Abba Shenikar, who moved up in Yisrael, I'm sure that the Ein Tzarech Yisrael. Some distinction. It's not even clear, though. He makes that point. It's not even clear that that's his real opinion because elsewhere he seemed to be saying Klav Iker. That was just uh, like the Shita Scha. Elsewhere he writes. No matter what, even if the guy is wearing the most normal clothing, you have to do the opposite to the right, to the left. So that's how he phrases what the other people, the other camp is saying, and he thinks that's you know ridiculous. That's what he's trying to debunk. In that spirit, the Marek concludes, and uh, I try to keep it relatively short to give you the main gist of it. Now, if you look in Shulchan Aruch, it's the other day of Simen Kofay and Ches, which is pretty close to Hilchas Ribis, and I'm sure you probably know that the reason why Hilchas Ribis is here is because the Torah was talking only about Ribis to a guy. The context here was Dinim relating to Goyim, and then the Torah said, oh, once I mentioned the Dinim of Goyim, so while we're at it, then he goes in, into the rest of Hilchas Ribis, so it's the, the Simen Kofayans. So the Mechaber goes with the Rambam, he quotes the language, the style of the Rambam. The Ramah quotes the Marek. But when the Ramah quotes the, quotes the Marek, he only mentions the Tayalas, Refei Mumcha, Malbush Miyucha, Refei Umma, Mutu Leifshay, Kavari Tamacher. He doesn't actually address this Hemshech of the Marek about Bichlau, how should we look on a regular day? And uh, the Pashtus in Italy, like Marek says, they looked pretty much identical. And in Poland, where the Ramah was, they looked very, very different, and that wasn't being uh, challenged. So now we arrive at the time of the Tzemach Tzedek. Now in the Shut of the Tzemach Tzedek and Simon Tzedek and Tzedek Aleph, there are two Tshuvas on this topic. There's also like a Hashmata that was the Rebbe printed in the Miluim, it's in Simon Shin now. There's also a letter that was uh, publicized by Rebbe Levin, not a halachic letter, but relating to the history. Now these Tshuvas are not written so clearly, 
And in Hechel Baal we mentioned, I think also in the Haaris, the Tzemach Tzadik mentioned that the, the Tzemach Tzadik, we have Makaris that say that Tzemach Tzadik felt that he was being surveilled. He felt like he was under surveillance constantly. And for that reason, when he wrote about the Yom of Goyim, even to himself, he imposed self-censorship. So the Tzemach Tzadik writes, Akum, instead of uh, Goy or Rebbe Zara, even in his own Tzis Viyat Kodesh, and uh, Halacha, and it was because of that sense. So that's probably why also these letters are not fully, you know, clear. But it's once you understand what they're about, it's pretty clear. One is about the question of Chukas Agoyim, and one is about the question of Mesiris Nefesh for Arks of the Misani. Now, many people quote from these Semach Sadaks as if the Semach Sadak decided that this Taka no problem. But if you actually are Ma'ayin and the children, I'm not sure how many have actually done that, you'll see that not so fast. So it's, it's important to go through the Semach Sadak, so I'll try in the time we have to go through Simon Sadakal first. So first, the Zemach Sadek discusses the Gemara and Sanhedrin about Chukas HaGoyim, about a Saif, Misa Saif. It says over there that they did the Saif, Kedarech Shehamalchus Oysen. The Gemara says, what about Chukas HaGoyim? And uh, Chachamim say, it says Saif in the Torah. We got it from the Torah, we didn't get it from them. So from this Gemara is Mashma more that even something like Saif, which isn't very normal to just chop a person's head off in the normal way, it sounds like in the Gemara that if not for the Pasuk, because the Goyim did it that way, we would have to do it differently. So that's a Gemara that seems to expand the, the history of Chukas Agoyim. Then the Samasada quotes Iran in Sanhedrin. And the Ran says, no, it's all about Avayi Dezara. It has to be linked to the Derech of Avayi Dezara. And his big marker is from Masachas Avayi Dezara, where it talks about Surf and Al-Malachim burning the possessions of the king. And the Gemara also says, what about Chukas Agoyim? And the Gemara says, Lav Chuki, we're not, uh, why you don't call everything a chayk just because they're going to do something? So that Gemara seems to limit the Isser and anything you could say, I'm not doing it for a chayk, it should be fine, and the Ran goes with that. So the Bukhayrah Shvar and the Ran from Sanhedrin, and Tzema Tzedek says, Kush Yizu Hiksha Hagra, in Hagoya Sagra, near the day of Kufa in Ches, he says, the Ran, it's Tmua, Nege the Suri, the Sanhedrin. So Tzema Tzedek says, Either the Ram will say the Gemara Tzinhedrin that brought a Pasuk is Lav Dafke, even if there's any reason, even without a Pasuk material, really, it's fine. And the Gemara just mentioned, uh, you know, or you have to say the Sugis is Chalfesen, there's Taka two Sugis, and they don't uh, line up, and uh, the Ram chose to go with the Red Zara. Okay, that's one part of the discussion in the Tzimach Tzedek. Okay. Let me move on directly to the question of the Rambam and Malbushim. So he quotes the Rambam, the Kess of Mishnah says, it's from the Sifri, they're wearing this, I'll wear this, they're wearing that, I'll wear that. Um, but the Pirish on the Sifri is Malbush Chashuf, so that might make a difference. In the Sifri Yireim it says, I feel in an Avedis, I'm a Maisim Chukim Shehurgulu Haremim Lasses King Lashem Taira Shalahan, his Hira Taira Lehan. So the Zemach Sadek is not fully spelling out what he understands from here, but it could be these sources maybe seem to be saying only something that's chashiv, something that's shimtayr shalem, maybe regular clothing should be fine. Although later, the, the Zemach Sadek quotes the Rambam in line with those who say it's a problem. Then he says, Omnam asmag, the smag writes in this lav, Sheyehei Yisrael muvdol b'na oivit kachon b'malbush b'minha gubedibur. So it sounds like a positive thing, you have to look different. So from these sources, as we'll see throughout the Tshuva, he quotes this, he quotes that, he goes back, he goes forth, he's just laying out the information. Then Tzema Tzedek goes to Apostle in Tzvanya, and Tzvanya mentions, clearly it's being said as a negative. So, but what's Malbush Nachri? So now she says, that wouldn't be relevant. The to this David says, Malbush Huzar Milvushi Elam, sounds like nothing to do with Gaim Mechlal. Nachri just means different, People are wearing special clothing, so it also doesn't seem to be connected. Ibn Ezra says, Malbush Nachri connected Kala Am Derah Geus, Shalay Yilbash Adam Bamalbush Shehem. And later on, Zemachtak will also quote Ibn Ezra as a source that any clothing could be a problem. That's how the Zemachtak understands the Ibn Ezra on this Pasuk. Then there's the Gemara Brachis with the woman wearing red, and now she says, Levush Chashuv. So, is it, well, this, you know, that's almost like isn't explaining what you can derive from that, but you can either take it that it's Afghan or maybe not. Okay. Then he gets to Marik. And Marik is Madaik from Rashi, from the Rashi and Sanhedrin of Arks of the Masoni, that is a Tzad Yadus. And he said, Afilo and Higo Yisrael, the Malbush Echot, and the Goyim were a Malbush Acher, and Ain Malbush a Yisraeli, Mera al Yadus, Alat Snius, Yoyster, Meris, and Shagayim, if there's nothing more Jewish per se about the Jewish clothing, then uh, ancient Israel, that's uh, how he quotes the Ma'arik. 
Um, now, very uh, oddly, I might say, uh, Bar 11 in the Beis Agnazim, when he talks about this topic, he, uh, he quotes from the Tzemach Tzedek to tell you what the Tzemach Tzedek's opinion is, and he quotes this quote, the Afilu and Higi Yisrael, till the end of that quote, which uh, seems a very strange to be a very strange thing to do, because this is a more of a, a huge shock of Atariya, and the Tzemach Tzedek is literally just quoting the Marek, which is a very basic mocker on the subject, and he's just stating what the Marek has to say, and there's a huge discussion afterwards, so... Quoting that seems to be extremely out of context uh, and not representative of the tshuva. But uh, so that's that's this part of the tshuva. Then the says let's get into the rias. There's the mice and meila where the bruvim brings the bali had to change his haircut. Mashma that was the only thing he had to change. Which, these are my next rias. Or in chulin the guy who didn't wash until sidaim and the guy thought he was a guy and gave him treif. Oh the until sidaim was machshulin. What do you mean? Didn't he look Jewish? If he didn't look Jewish, why don't we blame the clothing? He didn't look Jewish. Is there an ayah that uh, it's all the clothing? You couldn't tell the difference. That's another one, Marek Zerayas. The Shach actually uh, slugs it up. Then in the Medrash that tells the story, it says it was a Shasa Shmad, not on clothing. So you were allowed to change your clothing with Shasa Shmad, and the only signal between Jews was until you die. Um, then the Semachsadik brings his own ayah to Marek from like, almost the opposite direction. And Shabbos, it talks about what one can wear on Shabbos, and it says, Arviyos Yoytzis Ru'ulas, the Arab Jewish women can mamish have their heads, their faces completely covered, uh, etc. So, now, uh, that's very extreme sneers, but on the other hand, we're saying that they're Arviyos, they're dressing like the Arab women, and that's why we're saying the Jewish women in Arabia can wear the Arabian women's clothing. So there's no problem. Because it's so tzniyastik, you know, if the Arabs are extra tzniyastik, we're allowed to, if you want to live there and limitate them, that's not an issue of uh, um, So that's the other Gemaras, which touch on this question of how did Jews appear vis-a-vis the Gaim, and perhaps from a historical perspective, the Bechalak between Eretz Yisrael and Babel, maybe Eretz Yisrael, <laughs> There was more of a difference, and that some sources, and maybe Bob, there was less of a difference, and that's other sources. But we'll leave that uh, to be explored. Um, so yeah, brings different gemaras where uh, there was a guy who was mistaken for a yid. So it's mashma that they looked the same. Well, maybe he changed. Maybe he disguised himself as a yid. And the medrashah is a ma'aser where they were yidden. It says shinu atifasam. They went undercover. So you see from the fact that shinu atifasam that otherwise they look different. Then from that discussion of the Rais and Chazal, then the Sefer wants to actually talk about the Marek's actual opinion. So it's not Teres Koyenim that we quoted earlier. Bechal mentions the other Teres, not the Sifri, Teres Koyenim says, theaters, those are Bechal, nothing to do with clothing. That's Pritzus. Um, the Sifri that said, this, they're wearing this clothing, I'll wear this, that you could say is not Bushim Chashuvim. That's Tam Levosh, and you, you, you have no intention of imitating. And that's the Marek's Taina, that has to be Shachatz and Gaiva, you're trying to imitate them. But when it comes to Ram, the Smag, and the Chinuch, they are even though even the Marek claim the Ram doesn't say that, and the Smag and the Chinuch are even the Smag and the are even more explicit. It seems pretty clear they are saying you simply have to look different. Gamma Divrei Rabbi Ben Azar and Svanya also Kashiolov. So you see that Tzemach is bringing both sides. Then he says the Gura also used the same question from Sanhedrin against the Marek. The word Sanhedrin seems to say that you need a Pasuk Dafka. But the, the Semach Sadek himself offers a, his own answer and he says, shiny Saif, that it only happens periodically, um, and he also Sreif al Malachim, because it's per, it happens periodically, that could be more of a chukah than regular things. A certain ritual to it. Then the Semach says, Malubish. I'll call upon him. Yeah, actually, you have to be dressed somehow. Ain't shayach lekreis chukah. Maybe my Rick will say that that's not a chayk. The hachreichu, you have to be dressed. Like shayach lekreis chukah, not going to be It's extra things. You have extras, a chop, something like that. That wasn't necessary. That could be a chukah. But to dress yourself in the morning, whatever you dress yourself in, you can say according to my Rick, that is fine. Now, in your Amram Bloy's article, he quotes from this par- paragraph, from this passage, and he claims this represents that Samach Sedek's Maskana. 
But if you are following here, the Semach Tzedek was going back and forth, and he's speaking the Shita Say of the Ma'arik, and he's saying the Shita Say of the Ma'arik, this is how he's going to find for it. What's the next paragraph? V'afu pikein, l'divri haram of asmag v'ru ibn Ezra, hu asr, ki even the Tzarek sh'yehe yisro muvdo, that you do have to just look different no matter what. And even from the Iran, he wants a medayek. So that's why those who claim that Semach Tzedek was maskana was such and such, that does not seem to be a fair uh, representation. It also means very original raya. It says in Kedoshim, Now, what has to be Havdalah. What's Havdalah? He says in Shabbos, we say, There's also Havdalah. What do we do on Shabbos? We wear different clothing. So you see from here that in order to be Havdalah, there has to be different clothing. Just like on Shabbos, the weekday. So Then he reverts back to the Marik side. Could be there's another raya to the Marik. Because Rashi, by Arts of the Masani, Rashi said, then he added, So Rashi himself is saying that there's no mitzvah to do this regularly. So that means there isn't a lav of Chukai Seim. If it was a lav of Chukai Seim on a regular day to wear the shoelaces, then the Rashi should have said it is a mitzvah. Rashi said it's not. Only Bishas Hashmad, when there's some link to Yiddish, so there's something, there's a level, according to Marit, you could say there's a level between uh, having, to, having to wear it all the time, but Bishas Hashmad, when there's an association, then you have to be Meister Nefesh. But then the uh, Semach Tzedek himself says that, uh, the, that the Marik saying that it was only the red shoelaces is the mitzay. Rabbi Nutam says for Kerr, even if the shoelaces are black. Now it's not really l'chayr ish the mitzay because Marik did mention Rabbi Nutam in that quote that I quoted where he was saying that maybe taka you have to change something. Maybe it could just be one small thing, which is a swear that Semach Tzedek Bechlau doesn't mention here at all. They did it. Maybe it could just be one small thing. Other Rabban at the time did mention that. Um, so in that context, he did mention Rabbi Tam, but otherwise, my dick didn't mention it. Someone else like my dick. The Rabbi Tam says that even if it is shchayr, you do have to be different. And still, Rashi says that it's not a mitzvah. So it could be that there's two things: there's a certain mitzvah of chukas and one of the things it's not a mitzvah, but you still have to be makpid on it, even shleib b'shas hashmad and b'shas hashmad if you moisir nefesh. And then the Tzema Tzedek concludes, that, by the way, in the shield, this is a whole different shot in Arkasa that has something to do with how the Velt understands it. It has to do with the Vedu Zara. Arkasa was something to do with the Vedu Zara. I'm not getting into that right now. But, and that's how the Tzema Tzedek concludes without a clear maskana. So, overall, the Tzema Tzedek was explaining both sides. Uh, Bechla, I would also be Magdur more as a Rishima rather than a Tshuva. Rishima means the Tzema Tzedek is just working through the information, working it out for himself. So, and I pointed out in two, in two places where people are uh, seeming to, seem appear to simply quote things from this tshuva out of context to misrepresent the spirit of the tshuva, because the last thing, after we quoted the Ma'arik, he said, And he says, And it's unclear why the Zemach Tzedek would have been, if his maskana was, the Ma'arik can outweigh the, the rest. And Bechlau, we know, historically in Poland, right, they didn't work taco always Makbid. Unlike Italy, they didn't follow the Ma'arik in that. We could discuss that more. There's also, in, in Simon Shin, there's also uh, like a Hashmata the Rebbe says, it was printed in the Miluim, uh, it talks about Hechalos, the question of, oh, the Rebbe says the Hechal has to be different. So some say, oh, the Ramesh means that if they build their building this way, you have to build their building that way, the Rebbe says, no, nah, I don't think so. Okay, again, both sides. Then, the Tzema Tzedek quotes him a few Midrashim about Va'avdil, and those Midrashim doesn't mention Levush. So the Tzema Tzedek writes, Ken l'chereraya, she'en chiv she'i a Yehudi muvdo b'levushay. And it's also been quoted, oh, you see, the Tzema Tzedek wrote, in chiv. But it's the middle of a shakta v'tari, it's shayach to the previous tshuva, it's like a hashmata. It doesn't seem fair. Again, he's just spelling out the, what you can be medayak in this medrash. Does this medrash outweigh all the other mekaitis and alacha? Who says? And he gets back to the end of uh, Havdalah, Va'avdil, and then he mentions, by the way, in the Gemara, Dafke, they didn't bring a raya from Va'avdil. When it says in the Gemara to wear different clothing on Shabbos, but not because of Va'avdil. It says, Yishlem, Rabbi Shabbos, like, Siv, Havdalah, Behejah. It doesn't say the word Havdalah in the Torah. We say, Amav, Mekayi, the Shlachayah. But it doesn't say the word in the Torah, so the Gemara couldn't have used it. That sounds like a raya back to his Svarah, that Havdalah means you do have to look different, but So I don't think you can uh, bring a raya from that line in the middle of that either. So we don't really have time to get into the other tshuva. And Simon Sadik, which is written more like a tshuva to Shaila, there's the question is of Mesiris Navish of Arks of the Misani. And again, we said the dinam are not identical, meaning even if on a roll maybe we could change, it might still be us, sir, if the government is making a decree. So he gets into the whole discussion of, uh, in Sanhedrin, uh, Esther, 
Perhaps yes. So there's two things in the Gemara. Karka Ayelam, she's passive, so she's not being able to have air, that's why it's okay. The other one is that it's Lahanos Atmai. So Tzema Sedex asks, what about in Ksubis, where it says that uh, they made a Gzeda, that she, to ball a Tafsir, and the Gemara says, what's the problem? Tell them that it's fine. You know, like Sakana here. Tell them that it's okay. You know, you're allowed to. And Mukhair over here, there is Hanas Atmai. But on the other hand, there's also a Havar Why did they make a Gzeda, she to ball a Tafsir? Clearly, they were trying to be married with the Yidin Adas. So there's this combination. The idea where it's partially the Havar al that's what it's a Gzeda, but there's also partially Hanar, because the Tafsar is having a good time, and the person who made the Gzeda isn't necessarily the person who's carrying it out. So you see that sometimes you have these complex situations, and the Chayra from here comes to us, that if there's a combination of the two, it could be that uh, we say it's Lanos, Atzma, and then someone's like the Machalash, and even there it's passive. There's, that's by Gilead Ayas. You need both. Karka Oil and Ananas Atzma. But if it's not Gilead Ayas, then maybe we could take that vart of Hanas uh, Atzma, even if it's a complex, partial Hanas Atzma, and apply it here. The Semach doesn't necessarily conclude clear that that's his opinion. Another Svar, there's five things the Semach Tzedek says, and without what we'll conclude. Semach Tzedek says um, that we have to follow what they say. They're claiming, the government is claiming, we're not trying to be marvel in al das, even though deep down we think that's what they really intend, but they keep on saying not, so maybe we should take their word for it. La halacha. Another, uh, another svara he says is that they're not offering the option of being killed here, Bechal. If you don't listen, though, he says they'll take you to, they'll conscript you into the army. You'll be even more averse. You didn't gain anything. Um, another thing is that Bechlal, the Shiltis, you can the for the Shiltis, Bechal doesn't hold of the Arkas, so his Taichin Arkas, doesn't do shoelaces, Bechlal which, you know, that's not really, uh, it's like a sniff. And a fifth thing he says is, is that maybe it's Bechal Shita that says that uh, it's not a problem with other Averis before Hesia, even though that's not what we do, the Alacha, but maybe it could be a sniff. You read the whole Shuva in its entirety, it sounds like, right, it sounds like he isn't very convinced by his own Svaris, and that line at the end, a sniff. Maybe the main reason Taka was the middle, that there's no choice, really. Like, we would love to be killed, which is not the greatest argument to say that Zemach Sadek holds that it's mutter. That Zemach Sadek is saying, of course, if we can get killed, we will get killed. But we can't get killed. We're just being forced. And there's actually a letter of the Rebbe, but it's been pointed out in Chelek Chaf. Someone asked the Rebbe about Levushim. The Rebbe says, The Rebbe says, uh, and the Rebbe seems to be saying, you see the Semach Tzedek? It says there is a problem with Chukas HaGoyim. And I, in some places, it only mentions Beard and Peyes and not Levush, because it's an extra thing. Besides Levush, there's also Beard and Peyes. So you see the Rebbe's understanding of this truth is also the at the Maskan of Tzedek, that it is a problem. So I know it's uh, we're in an overtime. The Maskan, what happened was, is that the Yidin in Russia, B'chlolos, were more compliant and that's what transformed the, and updated the Lavush of the Indian Russia by a lot at that time. The pants, the jackets, they were still wearing long coats, but they looked a lot different. In Poland, you had the Chedush Yerim, the Gera Rebbe said, you had a that's a whole chapter in the tone. Uh, so in Poland, they uh, resisted it a lot more, or as soon as they were able to switch back, they switched back. And in Russia, not so much. And then, of course, there were more things along the way. And then when, when, when Chabad moved from Russia to America, so uh, the American boys are already dressing like Americans, so the Russian Bachim already started dressing like the Americans. So the attitude changed that, you know, we still, like the Rebbe says, we're still trying to look different to some extent, but the takeaway was that, yeah, we're not, whether some upset it or not, other Chabad Rabban, which you don't have time to get into, maybe a different time, they said, as long as you look slightly different in some way, another way, obviously today we still look very different uh, than everyone around us, so like I said, we uh, we try to look different. That's we do seemingly hold of chukas agayim, etc. Whether or not there is exeda, but we're not dafka looking to keep it exactly the way it was. Mashenkin in Poland, they try to actually, you know, that's why you have some the mamish wear the, the short pants and the the coats, etc., etc. All right. <laughs>